Hello, everyone. Good morning, especially to our guests joining from Indonesia and also those joining from across the globe in whatever time zone you may be. Thank you for joining our joint public knowledge project ORCID webinar, where we will focus on four related topics by four speakers who are here with us today. First, we will speak about open journal systems or OJS usage in Indonesia. Second, ORCID in the Indonesian context. Third, the importance of OJS within the Indonesian context. And finally, a demonstration of the ORCID plugin within OJS. So if we stay on schedule, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Video and audio have been disabled for non-presenting participants, but chat is enabled and should be used for posing questions, which will be addressed at the end of all the presentations. Our first speaker, Juan Pablo Altgren, is the co-scientific director of PKP, associate professor in the publishing program at Simon Fraser University, and the co-director of the Scholarly Communication Lab, or the Scholcom Lab. Juan is a leading voice in open access and open science communities who can intermediate between the Latin American experiences and discussions about these advancements worldwide. Juan, you have the floor until 15 past the hour. Great, thank you very much, Uj, and thank you everyone for joining this morning. Uh, very excited to really get a chance to speak to this community as, uh, and as I will highlight, this is uh, Indonesia is the largest sort of national OJS community in the world. So it's um, really uh, an honor and really an exciting time to be able to um, speak to you all today and, and start to make contact and start to come to, um, uh, yeah, be, start a dialogue with with all of you and all of the work that you've been doing uh, using some of the work that we've been putting out as the Public Knowledge Project. Um, I'll start a little bit just with a little bit of an overview for those that are not so familiar with the Public Knowledge Project, uh, which is a project that uh, has been around now for 25 years, founded in 1988 by uh, by John Walensky, who I think I saw in the, uh, among our participants here uh, today. Um, the project, I think, really has as, at its heart, it does, we've been doing the software that's, as OJS since about 2002, but at the heart of the project, it's really a project about helping to make uh, knowledge public uh, in in all of its in all of its forms. Um, I'm going to highlight just a couple of things. I don't have very much time with you today, but I just want to highlight a couple of things, and I will invite you as I start to uh, dig into some of the statistics and some of the data that I'll be showing you can all be found in a publication that uh, we recently put out, trying to outline uh, just the extent and breadth of the users that are using open journal systems around the world. So I invite you to um, dig into that publication if you want to find out a little bit more. I'm only gonna highlight just a few of the, of the touch points, particularly as they pertain to uh, the users in Indonesia. Um, but as I was digging into the data and looking at, at the things that we've, uh, that I said you can find in this, in this publication and looking to see where open journal systems uh, is used around the world, I dug through some old presentations of mine and I found a presentation from back in 2010 uh, that showed you a little bit, or you can see just in very broad scopes around the regions of the world or where open journal systems is being uh, used. And you can see that there was uh, a big user base in South America, North America, and in Europe. And uh, you can see that the, the part of the globe there that's in, uh, in Asia is a much small, it's a very small piece. But if we look today and we look to see where uh, journals are using OJS now, uh, we see that it's a very different story. And you see there that uh, the the very the darkest part of this map is a part of the world that you will surely uh, recognize. Um, when we look at the specific numbers, we can see that the number of journals that are using uh, open journal systems, and this was at the count that we did when we published the paper, actually these numbers have gone up since, and I'll show you those in another moment, that there's been over 25,000 journals that are using uh, open journal systems that spread out over 9,000 over 9, installations. In 2020, there was over a million articles published using open journal systems. Important to highlight that amongst these journals, that the vast majority of them are all open access journals. And so in this sense, it's uh, the way in which the use of our software is contributing to making knowledge public by helping these uh, uh, all of these scholars from around the world making their content freely available for others to read. 
Um, we've got uh, numbers. We're kind of constantly updating these. And every time that we check, it seems that the number of users is, is growing. And so when we did another update of the numbers uh, uh, last year, we're finding already that there was another 8,400 more journals that were found. So we're still verifying these numbers and we'll be formalizing those out in another publication in the future. But just to give you a sense that there is this growth. Um, and to show that difference between the two numbers, if you look at the, the countries where journals have been using our software, where it is that we are able to um, see the, uh, the growth, you can first start to see you know, the, the countries that are in the top 10, but actually this map that we've had to create, uh, we had to actually cut off and only show the bottom part because if we show everything, including that, what we call a hockey stick and a very Canadian reference, that, that sort of exponential growth and that gigantic growth in the journals that are using open journal systems, it's Indonesia that's at the top of that graph. And you can, as you can see, it makes uh, the number of journals in every other part of the world seem so small uh, by comparison. And so back in 2010 and around the time of that first map I showed you, it was Brazil that was the country that had the most journals. But already when we're looking at the number of uh, the content that's available in OJS around 2014, Indonesia becomes the top country. And now if you look at the difference of scales in the two maps, it was 1,500 is where the scale on the map on the left, the graph on the left shows. When we're looking at the map on the right that includes Indonesia, we see that it's almost 15,000 journals publishing using open journal systems in Indonesia alone. Again, just to show you more concretely the numbers by region, this Asia Pacific states, or Indonesia included there is a 14,000, which Indonesia, like I said, is the vast majority of those. Um, Latin America continues to be a region that has uh, the, the second most number of journals using OJS, but it's really Indonesia that um, eclipses every other one. And what is, can be seen here, and this is an important part, and it's an important part of the contribution that OJS makes, uh, and I think of what we contribute to the global community, is not just around where in the world people are able to publish, but that using open journal systems, people are able to publish in their own languages and in the language of their countries. So unsurprisingly, English dominates and with, over, with around half of the journals publishing in English. But as you can see, one over one in five, almost a quarter of the journals using open journal systems, and that's again, thanks to all of you, uh, are published in Indonesian. So this is a contribution that uh, you're making to the global scholarly output that is made in your own uh, local uh, language. And uh, Spanish and Portuguese are third and fourth, that's the Latin American region coming out. So this is an important component, I think, of the, like I said, of the contribution that OJS is making uh, and that you are all making with the journals that you're publishing. Um, just to stay on this multilingual content uh, in this uh, publishing in English and in Indonesia, we see that actually about half of the journals, a little over half the journals publish in more than one language. So we see that uh, OJS is helping to enable this multilingual publishing. And we see that uh, folks in different parts of the world are contributing, not just in English, but again, making the, a really diverse global community that's participating. Um, and all this, it would be, it's, you know, it's a how do is it that we may manage to make this possible? And part is because OJS is one of these platforms that is able to actually has been translated into uh, dozens of languages. You can't read, obviously, on the right, but you see a very long list of all of those things in green. This is a list of all of the languages that the software itself has been translated into with the, the uh, elements that are all of the bars that are in green are languages that have full up to date translations. Uh, and I'm just going to just scroll through. And it's just, again, not so that you can read all of these languages, but just so you can get a sense of the number of languages that are um, uh, that the software itself has been translated into really speaks to the value that we as a, a PKP really place on enabling the publishing to happen using uh, not lo local languages and being hosted within the countries themselves where we see the, the scholarship. Um, enabled within the software by multilingual interfaces that I hope you're able to take advantage of and that you're using in the work that you do. Again, that put this multilingual publishing and thinking of a world community behind OJS is essential to the work that we do. And all of this fits into a framework of thinking around the work that we're doing in, uh, in terms of contributing to the open science movement. So OJS and the publishing of, of, uh, of things public using, um, using our software is part of what is commonly known as open access because most of these things are freely available for everyone to use and reuse. But we're also contributing to uh, open science more broadly by enabling people to publish even the, it, it, regardless of where um, they come from, publishing from different ways of understanding the world, publishing in different languages with the, with the worldviews of 
the local communities. Uh, and behind this is again, following with the UNESCO recommendations on open science and some of these important principles that are behind the open science movement to which PKP sort of wholly ascribes, particularly around the, the diversity and inclusiveness of uh, who should be able to participate in making their knowledge public, equity and fairness and making sure that they have the tools and abilities to do that without any restrictions uh, and providing uh, opportunities for doing uh, sort of equal opportunities and collaboration between uh, folks that are wanting to participate in knowledge production around the world. Where PKP fits into all of this is that our software has been intentionally made so that it can be taken up in different national contexts and in different institutional contexts. And the result is that there are thousands, uh, thousands and thousands of small independent distributed journals just like yours. Uh, and so in this way, I, I, and we think of the, the Public Knowledge Project as this project that we are all taking together with all of your contributions in making your scholarship that's coming from your part of the world with your perspectives available to others. And in that sense, uh, we thank you for uh, doing everything that you do with our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. Next. Brian Minahan is based in Kona, Big Island of Hawaii, and supports the strategic goals of ORCID consortium member organizations in Scandinavia, the Asia Pacific region, the United States, and Canada. Before joining ORCID, Brian was a scholarly communications librarian at Hong Kong Baptist University, where he was an advocate for open scholarship in Asia. Brian has also been a systems librarian and innovative in interfaces and a research associate at University of San Francisco's Ricci Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History. Thank you, Brian. You have until 25 past the hour. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you for having me. I'm very, very pleased to be here with uh, PKP in this uh, lovely meeting with the uh, Indonesia community. Um, so we don't have much time, but I'll just briefly talk about ORCID, uh, OJS in ORCID, and ORCID in Indonesia. Um, a bit of an introduction, so uh, thank you for that kind introduction. My colleague Estelle uh, works quite a lot with uh, PKP and um, our member organization in uh, Indonesia. Uh, so you may be uh, familiar with her. She is uh, at a conference in Japan uh, this week, so I'm filling in for her. Um, an explanation of what ORCID is. So we are a very small nonprofit, about 30 people, but we're really uh, concentrating about connecting research, uh, reducing administrative burden and connecting to other systems as much as possible. Uh, and we're just over 10 years old. Um, because you see us a lot of places, uh, sometimes it gets uh, a bit lost in the fog what we do. So we provide that 16-digit ID, which is a persistent identifier. We provide the ORCID record, which is free for researchers, and the ORCID API, which connects to other systems. Uh, there is a free public version, which many OJS journals use, uh, but we are actually sustained by member organizations using the member API, which has much more um, permissions. And actually, this is what populates the ORCID registry, as we call it, of so many ORCID records. Here's a bit of statistics. Uh, so I said we're sustained by member organizations. That's At the moment, that's just over 1,300. Uh, and they have a lot of integrations uh, right now, as you can see. Um, my role at ORCID, I work with the National Consortia. Uh, so we have pretty much 28 of those. Uh, this is where a number of member organizations in a particular country join together and they kind of uh, scale benefit. Um, so I work with the Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, Taiwan consortium, as well as uh, three North American ones and uh, the consortia in Scandinavia. But for everything we do, we try to keep the researcher at the center. And so that's why an ORCID record is free. Uh, and we try to offer these connections to the various systems. So you guys as OJS users, you are, of course, aware of the benefit of connecting the publishing system 
uh, sorry, your your researchers with the publishing uh, system. Uh, you can do that via ORCID, but we also work with universities, uh, funders, and uh, profile systems. When that all works very good, uh, we have organizations adding information to the ORCID record. So this is an example of uh, a well-populated ORCID record. So this researcher is getting the benefit of having, say, a review activity for a journal, uh, and also, let's see, what is that, the DOI? It must be a publication. So that is intended to um, add value for the researcher and save them time so that they can back, get back to uh, reviewing or um, research itself. This is just a um, graph of how many systems we interact with. So, so one thing I'm very impressed with is one and a half million uh, records updated with uh, works per month, that's quite a lot. Um, and this, as I said, it's supposed to uh, benefit not just the authors, but a number of uh, research activities. So I'm gonna share a bit about OJS in ORCID. Um, OJS is the largest system that we interact with. There's over a hundred um, integrations uh, with OJS uh, journals. So that's over 100,000 ORCID records have been connected and uh, quite a lot have been updated. And we also have some uh, in integrations with the preprint uh, systems. Um, this is just a demo. I will share these slides later of how you can uh, you utilize OJS to uh, have your contributors um, also named in, in a publication work via OJS. Um, so this is a great benefit uh, provided. And finally, um, I'd just like to share a bit about ORCID in Indonesia. So as a rather large country, you might not be surprised that uh, Indonesia ranks uh, number 15 in the world of researchers with ORCID records. Um, quite a lot of those are active, so just over half. And there's over 200,000 affiliations that uh, employment, education, uh, service, um, any other uh, sort of professional uh, role. And uh, as I said before, Relawan Journal is uh, our one member organization uh, in Indonesia, and they are an OJS um, system. I'm also sharing this um, graphic of how many, uh, where researchers are affiliated in Indonesia. Um, this may be useful for you. However, as I said, affiliations and adding to the ORCID record is only available when you're a member organization. So what we uh, hope for in the future is to add value for Indonesian researchers. That's more connections to member APIs and perhaps taking advantage of the fact that you can use OJS to add information to an ORCID record, not just submit a manuscript. Um, and <clears throat> perhaps in the future, consider uh, forming a consortium of, you know, at least five or more organizations uh, that use the member API. Uh, I think someone will talk about um, PKP's uh, recipient of this uh, Global Participation Fund. This is a, a, an initiative to uh, increase value for OJS um, organizations in Indonesia. Um, and that originates from this uh, Global Participation Fund. I have a link here. Our next uh, round of disbursements is in quarter uh, two, so I'd say March or April next year. Uh, please have a look and consider if you'd like to apply for either for the uh, Global Participation Fund. Um, and please reach out uh, to Estelle or myself, and we'd love to uh, talk with you and learn more about your OGS systems. Here, Makassi. Thank you. Next, we have Harry Pernobasuki, who is a professor at Ayurlanga University's biology department. He's a re he is renowned for his expertise in plant structures, particularly mangroves. Holding a PhD from Tohoku University, Japan, he has contributed significantly to the scientific community with over 60 papers and projects. Notably, Professor Pernobusuki 
is the head of the Institute of Innovation, Journal Development, Press and Intellectual Property Rights at Universitas Irilanga. He has been instrumental in advancing OJS in Indonesia, particularly at that university where 102 journals are managed under his guidance. Professor, you have until 35 past the hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you see my slide? <clears throat> okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Uh, at this time, I would like to share a brief information about our institution also about journal management in our university and also its relation to utilization uh, the youth of OGS as well. First of all, I would like to point out of our university international standing. Uh, we still struggle to increase. We are ranked in 345 internationally and in national we have our fourth. Uh, I would like also to uh, inform to you about this is the main strategy of our rector that we, we call smart strategy, where the tax of our duty of our institution is primarily to support in M strategy. That means the meaningful research and community service. That is the output of the research, some kind of publication, books, and journal, also intellectual property. Uh, we manage about this. Uh, Udras Airlangga is one of the publisher in Indonesia. In uh, our university, we call AUP, Airlangga University Press, about 130, 103 journals at Airlangga are under the management of our institution. Uh, until now, uh, thanks to God, we have already 12 journals indexing by Scopus and one journal index by ESI or Web of Science, 56 journal index by DUIJ and 85 journal indexing by Sinta. Sinta is a national indexing in Indonesia that built by our government. Currently, the publisher position of the Airlangga University is in the fourth place on the national indexing by Sinta. <clears throat> so all journals in Unras Airlangga are open access and have copyrights licenses under Creative Commons attribution and also use the open journal system or OGS platform. <clears throat> this is the position of the journal owner by the Sinta indexing. We place in the fourth place after Universitas Diponegoro. <clears throat> and also about 113 maybe, I, I don't know the development until now. The journals in Indonesia is uh, all already indexing by Scopus. So, Oh, 12 of this uh, from uh, Airlangga University. So I would like to <clears throat> show you about uh, uh, our institution and meet the teams of our institution also. Uh, we call in Indonesia is LEPJP HKI. It's a long name uh, built by our rector. It's a combination of units, some units uh, work in here, namely the journal development, uh, and scientific publication, also Airlangga University Press and the Institute for Business Development and Incubation. And we was found in October 2020. So if you want to know more about our journal, you can access this, uh, this link. Uh, this is me. <laughs> I'm a chairman of this institution. Also, uh, the secretary is Dr. Ferry. Now he's still in overseas. Maybe today we will back to Surabaya. <clears throat> uh, he is a coordinator of the management of uh, all journal in Universitas Elanga. Uh, and also uh, the responsibility about the implementation of the conference, especially the international conference, Dr. Desi Harisanti, and supported by staff Diah Alinea. And this one is the publishing team uh, in our office. They are responsible for, responsible for managing the publication of books from the academic community in Universitas Elanga, as well as from the outside of our university also. Furthermore, this is the team that also helps the institution to manage several other things. This includes 
Innovation Intellectual Property, uh, the coordinator uh, Dr. Indria Wahyuni, and then the <clears throat> scientific publication incentive team, Dr. Windarto, and also the ranking and publication team, uh, the coordinator is uh, Ayulana, Dr. Ayulana Navisa, and the other is our administration team. Uh, we also assisted by staff on the staff who take care of information system for the needs of all our program implemented by our institution. He is uh, Muhammad Iqbal. Next, I would like to share some experiences and good practices in using OGS for the journal management purposes at Universitas Ailanga. This is the history. At the beginning, we managed the this journal <clears throat> manually and maybe just a simple system. At the time, there was uh, no system that we use uh, like uh, OGS. Uh, you can imagine maybe how troublesome and complicated to manage a uh, hundred journal in in our university by <clears throat> a simple system. So since uh, 2015, the Indonesian Ministry of Higher Education stipulated the obligation to use an electronic journal system for applying for national accreditation. So if uh, we have a journal in our university or the other university must be accreditation by our government, we must use the electronic journal system. So after this, we made change to the journal management system. What previously used manual methods have become more organized and all processes are carried out online. So, Udwes Ailanga first used the open journal system uh, version 2, OGS2, for electronic journal management, where the online submission to publication process was carried uh, in each stage. And then in 2022, uh, Udwes Ailanga decided to update the OGS system to version 3. So I think this is uh, good for us because there are many benefits for us where this upgrade process was carried to increase the functional and security of your our journal. And also, I think OGS3 provides various improvements and feature changes that will have improve the user experience and journal management. Uh, this is the performance of uh, the first website of our journal. And the second is the website of OGS version 2. And now we use this uh, <coughs> OGS versi 3, this website uh, like this. <clears throat> uh, I think when we use X, uh, OGS, uh, we have some uh, benefit. And in OGS 3, I think the way it works, uh, it's easier to change compared to version 2. In version 2, the step from submission to publishing must be followed sequentially. But in this uh, now, in OGS 3, we can go straight from delivery to production with a single click of the send to production button. I think it's very, very good for us. And the themes in OGS3 are more adaptable to screen size, some kind of mobile phones, tablets, uh, or to desktop. And OGS3 provides better support for journal publishing in multiple languages also, including the ability to manage content in multiple languages more efficiently and more user-friendly, I think. Uh, this is the best practice in our university. We conducted workshop training after we changed to our GS3 and upgrade. We invite all manager or editor of journals in Airlangga University to know about this by this workshop and training to use the uh, GS3. Also, we conducted uh, assistance every year for each journal. Uh, there also was supported by one mentor to uh, give uh, some assistance until uh, the journal will uh, increase the, the quality also the anything that can maybe uh, make the journal be become better <clears throat> so in this year in 2023 we have some <clears throat> program or activities first we conducted workshop Web of Science, we invite uh, some uh, expertise. So you, we can also, we also invite journal managers at uh, our, our university who have target of uh, mentoring in AISJ or Web of Science, smoothly understand the submission process 
to reputable international indexing and can be indexed by web of science. Also, we conducted workshop of the OIG. More than 50 journals of Unres Alanga are not yet indexed by the OIG. So we decided to make this workshop uh, on uh, 26 and until 27 June in this year for journal manager in UNAIR. We hope after this activity, many journals can be indexed also by the OIG. And also, uh, this is also the important thing for us. We conducted workshop in Scopus, all journal managers at Unibras Elanga, who have a target uh, for his journal or her journal to uh, Scopus. We assisting which Scopus can take advantage in this activity so that they can prepare and have a view towards the status of a reputable international journal that can be indexed by Scopus. Also, we conducted a group discussion. Uh, we need uh, all of journal become reputable and also uh, become and globally. So journal manager at our university who still like and at the other board from overseas reviewer, also authors can utilize the facilities from uh, our unit, Airlangga Global Engagement UNAIR to increase diversity and can collaborate with selected academic to promote their respective journal. Okay, I think that's uh, all that I can present today. The brief information, I, will, uh, I hope this information can be available for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was an excellent history of OJS at your institution. I learned quite a bit. Next, we have Eric Hansen, who is a systems developer at PKP and works closely with both PKP hosting and publishing services, as well as PKP's development team. Eric holds a Master of Library and Information Studies from the University of British Columbia and a Master of Publishing degree from Simon Fraser University. Eric, you have until 10 to the hour. Thanks so much, and hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a demonstration of the ORCID plugin functionality in OJS3. Uh, specifically Open Journal Systems 3.3, our long-term support version that will continue to receive support through 2025. Um, and today, there are a number of things that I'd like to highlight about the ORCID plugin and OJS3, uh, but one of the most important things are about how these some of these key features in the long-term support version help enable interoperability with other systems. And this is primarily done through our plugin ecosystem uh, these interoperabilities are key for driving discoverability of journals um, through the different functionality of the plugins, and these can be key for helping with indexing, which can help drive discoverability. This makes sense. Information must first be available in different formats that our other systems can understand. Um, so today I'm going to showcase some of the ORCID functionality. And so some of the key features of the ORCID plugin that I'd like to highlight before going through the demo um, are the types of things that it can do. So it allows journal managers to be able to send email requests by requesting ORCID authentication from authors on submissions. And this can happen at any point in the process, which is helpful depending on your individual workflows. Uh, it enables automated email-based ORCID authentication when a submission enters production. And it also allows us to display ORCID status in the author's metadata. So these are all of the default publicly available features. And I'll also be highlighting some of the member API features as well. And this is what I'll be doing a demonstration of. Um, they allow, plugin allows synchronizing submission metadata to authorize records on or post publication. So this will allow OJS to send information to ORCID to update individual authors or contributors records. And this can happen when a submission is assigned to a submission or to an already published issue, uh, when a new issue is published, or when an author grants permission that work can be linked to OJS after an issue has already been published. It's also possible for peer review contributions to be added to an authorized record upon review completion. And this works for both anonymous and open peer review. Okay, so I'm going to start by showing how plugin setup looks and go through example of the author workflow and the peer review workflow. 
So first, we'll take a look at what the plugin looks look like. The Orchid plugin is shipped with OJS3 by default. And for the sake of the demonstration, I have some things already enabled, but I'll show you what that looks like. So we come to the plugin tab, we make sure it's enabled first, and then we can set up the various settings. And for this demo, I already have all of the API and authentication information set up. We'll be using the member sandbox testing API. For the review functionality to work, we also need to have a country and city set up. And for what we want, we also want to make sure that we're sending email requests to authors when an article is accepted. So we'll go ahead and enable that. Next, we'll take a look at an example submission. I've come up with a fictional article here. And today, as some of the previous speakers were mentioning, with OJS3, you can work around the workflow in a way that makes sense for you and your use case. And for my demonstration, I don't really need to do a review, so I can accept and skip the review and move directly to the next stage. We'll skip the email for this. So now that it's moved into the copy editing and production stage, we should expect that the author would have received an email. So we'll check our test email here. And we do have requesting orchid record access. So this is an email that was sent to the author of that article saying you've been listed as an author on this manuscript. Please allow us to add your orchid ID to this submission and also to add the submission to your orchid profile and publication. So we would like to go ahead and do that. And we'll log in with this author's ORCID information and be sent back to the original journal. So now we see that our ORCID ID has been verified and successfully associated with this submission. And submission will be added to our ORCID profile record once it's been published. We'll go back to the OJS workflow. And we'll review some of the contributor information for that publication. Now that we've seen that the author has gone ahead and linked their work. If we go to edit the contributor information, we'll see that indeed that author's work ID has been updated in OJS. Sorry, that's my fault. We can ignore that. Next step here will be publishing this article for the sake of this demo. We'll go directly to schedule this for publication and we'll publish it in an already published issue so that we don't have to go through those additional steps. But in the normal workflow, when you assign it to a future issue, what we're about to do would happen when the issue is published, not when it's necessarily assigned to a future issue. But for this example, we'll go ahead and assign it to a back issue. So it will be published immediately. We see that this article has successfully been published. So now let's go ahead and take a look at it on the front end. We see that the author information is here and the author's ORCID is also here. We click through that author's ORCID page. We'll see that listed under the works. We now see that article we just published. And this is the functionality of the member API that pushes this information from our journal integration to ORCID directly, along with any other metadata that's associated with it. Even if you are using the public API, not using the member API, this ORCID badge will still show up here. It will just not get pushed directly to the service itself. Okay, the second thing I would like to show an example of how the reviewer credit workflow works. I'll take 
another article here that has just been submitted. And we'll take it through a fictional review process with a reviewer who wants to have their ORCID profile credited with a review. So we'll start by sending this submission to the review stage. And we need, as the editor here, we need to assign a reviewer. I'll once again assign myself as the reviewer for this. And once again, we'd expect to receive an email inviting us to complete this review. Now I'm logged in as the reviewer. I see this request for the review. We'll skip a lot of the details of the workflow here, but information about how all of this works in OJS3 is available through various PKP resources on the various steps in the workflow and the editorial workflow. So for our example, we'll go ahead and assume that this reviewer is going to really say that this should be accepted for submission and submit our review. But there's one final thing as the reviewer that we'd like to do here first. I want to go to our profile and we want to link our ORCID ID. And we see that that happened instantly because in the previous example, we had already logged into ORCID. So we were already logged in. So as soon as we hit connect, it knew that we were logged in and linked the ORCID there. Now that we're done with that, we can go back to the review workflow. And we see a new review has been submitted. And we'll do this from the perspective of the journal editor. So we'll use an admin feature of OJS. When you are on as the site administrator, you're able to log in and complete other actions as different users. So for the sake of this demonstration, we'll log in as if we were that acting as the journal editor here. We'll look at the review. And because this is a fictitious example, there's nothing to actually review or see. So we'll go ahead and confirm this. And then the final step in adding this contribution for the reviewer is going through this thank reviewer process. So this is sending an acknowledgement to the reviewer, and this text can be customized along with any of the other email messages that you've seen so far. We'll go ahead and do that. And then, even though this submission has not been published yet, the review process has been completed. So when we log back into ORCID, you'll see that there is now a new entry under peer reviews and review activity for this, where this review activity was credited. And if this had been done as part of an open peer review or information about the publication it would be present here as well. So that's really all I wanted to show you today. I wanted to just give a brief demonstration of some of the things that others have talked about and others have shown about how OJS interacts with ORCID and how these processes can help increase discoverability, but also just link and create more connections between the works and making it easier to put some things into your ORCID profile as well. Now, even if you're not using the member API, all of these things will still show up on OJS. So you still have the added benefit of having links from OJS to ORCID, even if it's not the other way around. So uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate you taking the time to learn a little bit more about the OJS ORCID integration. Thank you so much, Eric.
And before we go to questions, I want to share that I will be traveling to Indonesia in late February of this upcoming year, 2024, and making campus visits, as well as visits to organization involved in scholarly publishing. Um, to hear more about what your needs are with regards to OJS and other PKP software. So if you're interested in a, a visit to your institution, I am asking that folks fill out this poll to help me organize my itinerary for the trip. So it's now included in the chat. Um, I'll also share that we have other members of PKP joining us today in this webinar. Our founder and co-scientific director, John Walensky, is here, as well as our director of operations, Kevin Stranick. So as I pose this next question, if um, folks want to sort of unmute themselves and go on camera, if you feel comfortable to answer the question, please do. And our first question is about upgrading. So John Hardy asks, our journal still uses OJS2 because we heard that there is a risk in migrating from OJS2 to OJS3. Will OJS2 remain sustainable? So it's sort of about the risk versus the reward. Um, Juan, Eric, anyone else who wants to address this question, I invite you to speak to it. Sure, I'm happy to take it. Uh, um, thanks for the question. So OJS 2.48 is uh, has been uh, has not been active development development for quite some time now. Uh, we really uh, very much strongly recommend that you upgrade to OJS uh, to the at least version 3.3, if uh, if not a more recent version. The there is more risk with not upgrading, I would say, than than to upgrade. First of all, some of the great features like the Orchid features that was presented today are really available uh, for OJS 3 uh, only and not for OJS 2. But uh, like I said, OJS 2 is no longer under active development and has not been for quite some time. Um, we know that there has been some um, some, sometimes reluctance or challenges with upgrading. Um, I would say that the documentation for upgrading is quite complete now, and you can find it in the PKP documentation hub, and we, may, we can put a link to that uh, in the chat uh, in a moment to make it easier for you. Um, uh, so I would say that uh, OJS 2.x should not be considered uh, a, a, a stable or, I mean, it's been around for a long time, so it is stable, but it, ha it does not receive any security updates. It doesn't receive any new features. And so... Uh, you really um, would be best uh, to upgrade to the latest version or to at least version 3.3, which is considered to be a stable long-term release version that will be supported for at least another uh, year. Thank you. I actually have a follow-up question. Can reviewers directly embed their reviewing activities in an OJS2 ORCID? Um, anyone able to answer that, please do. Sorry, I'm happy to take that. So the, the OJS the, and, and uh, Eric can provide the details on which versions the, all of the features that he presented today are available for. So maybe Eric, you can uh, fill in that the detail on exactly which version uh, more precisely than I can. But I can say that the features of being able to communicate the uh, reviewer activity to ORCID uh, is not available for OJS 2.x. So, so to take advantage of this and many, many other new features, as well as an updated interfaces, the multilingual interface that I showed a little bit earlier, there is really a, a lot of work that's been done um, since the versions of two, uh, OJS 2 that you might be using. Uh, and so um, you will not be able to unfortunately take advantage of the uh, ORCID features on OJS 2. Um, and Eric, maybe you can fill in on exactly what is the minimum version that you need of OJS to be able to use the reviewer uh, ORCID feature. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I would say the minimum version that you would want to use for this is OJS 3.3, which is the long-term support version. Um, these features are also present in the current release, OJS 3.4. Um, but I would say that 3.3 is the minimum version you want to be using for all of these things. Also, because that because it is the long-term support version, that means if things aren't working or if things break down the line within the next year, they will get fixed, even though it's not the newest release, but because it is the long-term support release. So things may be present in earlier versions, but as things change, they will not continue to receive support. So you want to make sure that you're targeting um, OJX 3.3.
Um, another question. Is it possible for ORCID ID to credit editor from OJS3? Uh, I can speak to that. It is not possible currently, um, but I know that those are some of the types of things that we're looking for in future versions. Uh, one, maybe you know some, some more about some of the credit uh, developments that are coming down the line. Yeah, and I might even invite John to uh, jump on stage if he's available to answer this. I'll say one of the one of the things that we're working on at PKP is something that we call the, the part of the Journal Integrity Initiative, and we're developing and testing out right now. Actually, have a couple of research projects underway to evaluate something that we're calling a publication facts label. One of the elements of the publication facts label, which is intended to provide some transparency about who are the people that are behind. Uh, are running and operating a journal as well as some transparency about the processes to help people to educate the public on uh, the, uh, the scholarly um, uh, standards that are being followed by a journal. And part of the activities there and part of the developments of that publication facts label include being able to indicate who on the editorial board um, have uh, the ORCIDs. And the idea is to be able to indicate on your ORCID record that you are an editor of the journal and on the journal be able to sort of indicate that, that with the presence of the board, be able to link to your to each of the uh, editors uh, ORCID record. So we are working on making those links available and the idea is to, to be able to uh, essentially validate with a similar process that what we're doing with, with authors and with reviewers, um, not in the current version of the plugin as Eric just said, but something that we are looking towards as part of our initiative around being able to help journals to show um, be more transparent about what is the editorial process and help educate their audiences about how they're following scholarly standards. There are no questions that are open currently, but I, I um, do ask that any questions be either added through the Q&A feature or in chat. And we're happy to stick around. We still have five more minutes for the webinar. While we wait for another question to jump in, I wanna, I'm gonna, I'll just use another minute or two to reiterate a couple of things that I was saying and uh, at the outset to say, first of all, how uh, excited we are that you have all chosen to gather here today. We have seen the rise in the use of OJS and the interest in academic publishing from uh, from Indonesia. Um, but to say and to to really help you to understand that this you are part of a very large global community that is trying to make their research and scholarship available uh, to the world. And so uh, I want to say that with, with Rouge's visit that's coming up in February, well, with this webinar and with that visit, uh, we really like to make a very concerted effort to engage with you all, to learn more about your needs, how we can support you. It is the intent of, OJ, of OJS and of the Public Knowledge Project uh, from its outset is to enable you to do the publishing the way that uh, the way that you want to and to be able to take control of that publishing yourself. And so for that, it is essential that we have a line of communication where we can understand how we can support your needs. You, you are, like as I pointed out with that graph, the largest community by far in terms of uh, when looking at the national level. Um, and so it's essential to learn what are the challenges that you're having. So if you're having challenges with the upgrading, if you're needing to have certain features that are currently not in the system that you would like to have that would facilitate things that might help you operate in international context, um, really want to encourage you to reach out to us through the forum to uh, fill out Uruja's mm -hmm. poll so you can maybe get it, to, she can perhaps uh, visit or you have a chance to speak with her in person when she is there. Um, but uh, to say that you are part of a large global community, uh, uh, we are very welcome part of that community and that we want to make sure that we're able to attend to your needs for which we need to have these kinds of engagements. Um, Thank you. I uh, Two questions came in, Juan, um, while you were speaking. And this next one, I think, would be best addressed by Professor Purnabuski. Um, it's from RJI, so Relawan Journal Indonesia. Is it possible to make an MOU with UNER in managing the journal? Yes, I, I think it's very, very possible. So you can contact me or I'll contact our 
of this, and then we can discuss later. Thank you. <clears throat> awesome. And one more, does late payment of website rental fees cause the OJS of a journal to be lost? Sorry, maybe the term I used is not correct. So um, I'm guessing this is regarding hosting from my understanding of the question. Would anyone be able to speak to that? Sounds like it's a specific question, depending on where you're doing your hosting and who your hosting provider is. So one of the things and the features of OJS, like as I was saying before, is that it's intended that you can take the software and run it yourself. So it means that in some instances, you might be running on uh, servers that are being that are commercial servers from a company that's providing those hosting services where they have the version of the software and you're using their space and their uh, infrastructure to be able to um, make your journal available. In other cases, it might be your university or institution, uh, or you could be using uh, PKP offers hosting services as well. And so the what happens if you if it's a commercial arrangement and you're needing to pay and you don't, that will have to be specific to your situation and the provider where you're doing your hosting. So unfortunately, not something we can answer specifically without knowing those details. Um, it's something that you will have to take up with wherever you have contracted to have your journal they'll be able to tell you what would happen if you don't pay. Um, I'll add one other little bit is that all journals using OJS versions uh, 3 and above, uh, 3.1 and above, are able to take advantage of the PKP Preservation Network. We call PKP PN, the Preservation Network. It's a free service that we provide by PKP by which you can uh, essentially share your content of your journal with us. Once you've published one issue, all you have to do is configure that plugin. Again, we can put a link to the documentation on how to enable that in the chat in a moment. Um, and then your content will be preserved. So even if it goes offline because of uh, not because you don't pay, because the hosting provider goes online, because of any other catastrophe, uh, the journal will be preserved and that content could be made available. So the content wouldn't be lost even if your journal itself goes offline. So so please do take advantage. Everybody should and could can and should configure the PKP Preservation Network plugin, PKP PN, free service provided, and it guarantees that your journal will stay online. Your content will be available online, even if your journal goes offline for whatever reason. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Harry, Eric, and Brian, and everyone who attended the webinar today. It, it was recorded. It will be saved and published. Um, and everyone who registered will receive a, um, a link to that information. And otherwise, we will publish it. Um, we have one more question that came in, but we are also at time. So what I can do is take note of it. And hopefully, we'll be able to respond asynchronously by email if that's okay. Thank you all again, and have a great day or evening wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you next time, Juan, Eric, and also Brian. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.